Welcome back. What's it like being a young Canadian-born Imam? To help us better understand this experience, we've invited Imam Ibrahim Hindi of Dar al Tawheed Islamic Centre. He has a degree in History of Religion from the University of Toronto with a concentration in Islamic Studies. Let's hear about his journey to become an Imam and the challenges he faces in his daily work. Welcome back to our show, Imam Hindi. Thank you for having me. So we're going to shift the conversation a bit. So what inspired you to become an Imam and quit your day business job? I read that online somewhere. <laughs> so I have to throw that in there. Yeah, so uh, I was just doing side community work. Uh, I've been given khutbahs in mosques, um, some of the larger mosques even in, in Toronto since I was 18. So I've been involved in, in the da'wah, in, in the call, in, in, uh, inviting people to Islam and teaching people about, about Islam for a long time, but it was kind of a side project. Yeah. And uh, I was working in the in the business world, but at some point I kind of had to make a decision because the work was getting too much. I was I was either needed to dedicate myself to um, my job, my business work, or I was going to have to dedicate myself to the community. And I just felt far more passionate about dedicating myself to the community. Um, so at that point, I just decided, okay, I'm just going to quit my job and jump into this and, and see where it goes. And so, alhamdulillah, it's been <clears throat> about a couple of years now, and I'm working as, as an imam as well. And uh, what, what training uh, have you had? So uh, in university, I kind of did the opposite of what many imams do. Usually they go overseas and study, then they come back and might study a little bit more. I studied here at the uh, University of Toronto. Um, I did a, a degree in religious studies. I studied uh, concentrating on Islam, um, and then after that, I I did um, uh, I'm working on a master's with uh, Medina International University based right in now. Malaysia. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm working on that, uh, and so that's more of a traditional Islamic um, education versus the University of Toronto. But I'm getting a little bit of so I got a little bit of both uh, sides of those. So uh, that's been my education, and informally I've studied since I was very young. I went uh, to Egypt. I've studied in some schools there as well. So. I've had the opportunity to study with different scholars uh, in the Middle East as well. So my story is a bit unique from uh, the average man, but uh, that, that's been my training. And you also um, do have studied a bit of counseling as well, right? Yeah, so I've, I've done some extra studying as well to try to augment <laughs> what I have. So I've, I've done some courses on marriage counseling um, and uh, tried to uh, learn some principles uh, about marriage counseling and tried to translate them to um, the Muslim setting and, and our mm -hmm. Islamic principles. So obviously there's a lot that you're doing, you know, there's also the extremism uh, work and, and dealing with that. Um, there's helping the Muslim community. We're dealing in a climate where, you know, you said you have a lot of youth as well who come to you in the earlier segment about the Friday prayers uh, issue that happened. So we're dealing with times of increased Islamophobia. So what role do you think imams have uh, in supporting these wide range of issues? So I think the imams have to be more engaged in these issues, um, particularly issues. What do you, sorry, before I, we go <coughs> further, what do you mean by engaged? So engaged can mean uh, just educating yourself about them. Uh, sometimes uh, many imams are, are focused, you know, and you can appreciate this, they're focused, their, their minds are in books of, of mm -hmm. tafsir, of fiqh, of the things that they're teaching, of, you know, uh, theology, of, of uh, Quranic explanation and so on. So their mind is not really on these other social issues. But it's important for them to be more educated about those social issues, um, to educate their, uh, their congregation about them, to raise money, to deal with issues like um, Islamophobia, like bigotry and, and intolerance and how to deal with that. So they need to be a little bit more engaged, that's my advice. And, uh, and they also need to, um, to reach out to other voices in the communities who might know how to deal with these problems. Because sometimes there's a problem and it gets thrown to the Imam, it gets put on, on our doorstep and people expect us to react as though we're experts in media and we're experts in political that engagement we're experts. <laughs> and it's impossible to expect that an imam is going to have all that that capability so it's important to reach out to people in the community who might be experts in those areas um, as part of our religion we should be always seeking the advice of people who have knowledge so if the knowledge is outside of um, our expertise we should be looking for other people who have expertise there and to engage with them so that we can deal with these problems in, in professional uh, in effective ways. Um, I know in an article in the National Post you had mentioned that you yourself had uh, you know a brush or an experience with that. How has that experience impacted the way you now deal with some of the issues that you get uh, with youth who potentially might have extremist ideas? So I think it's kind of put me in their mind where I understand their emotions, I understand their feelings when they're being exposed to some of the stuff that these uh, crazy groups like ISIS uh, teaches. 
And so it helps me empathize with them, and it helps me understand where they're coming from, and it also has allowed me to understand how to uh, contradict or how to um, show that their teachings are wrong and what they're, what they're trying to call towards is wrong, and that sometimes they're preaching this utopia vision, this utopian vision, and the reality behind it is completely the opposite. And so it's given me a lot of insight on how to deal with, with, with that issue. And, uh, and it's allowed me also to realize that we have to do a lot of outreach uh, before any, any young Muslim gets exposed to these ideas to teach them about this, to allow them to understand what's happening in the world and how our religion is so different from what uh, those people are teaching. Now, I know you do a lot of that in your own um, center um, at the mosque. So tell me a little bit about some of the programs um, or types of programming that you do that addresses the social aspect. I know I've seen online videos about you know, that you've done about um, being Muslim and black and sort of, you know, giving talks on that. So how does that factor into the work that you're doing with youth? Yeah, so that was actually part of a larger project where we're trying to do Islam for teens. Mm -hmm. And we're giving, you know, very short uh, videos on, on social issues that young Muslims are, are facing in their lives and talking to them about it from a very Islamic perspective so that they can understand um, they can understand these issues from a Muslim perspective. And so giving them, you know, these tools, these resources, having different events, uh, and I try to engage different age groups as well. So even from, you know, 4 to 12, we'll have story nights at the mosque, and they'll come and we'll discuss stories from the Qur'an and ask them questions and give them a quiz, and to just really get them engaged um, with, these, with, uh, with their religion and with their Islamic identity from a very early age and to have different programs for different ages so that they're constantly engaged as they're growing up at that mosque and, and th there's different things for them to do. And, uh, and that's, that's really important. To, as long as you have them engaged and they're in the mosque and you can always have that communication with them, you hope that if there's any, ever an issue or something that's concerning to them, that they feel comfortable enough to come to you and to talk to you about these issues So do well. you think based on you know, the way you're talking about the importance of engagement, having a place for kids to grow up, is the mosque becoming now in this day and age more than just a space for spiritual gathering? Is it becoming more of a community center gathering sorts? Like what's what is what is what is the mosque of today? So I think it it needs to be that community gathering place. Um, you know, if we think about it uh, just uh, strategically, it doesn't make sense to be spending all of this money on a masjid that gets filled up on Fridays and is empty the rest of the week. It needs to be a place where people can actually gather, they can talk, and that was the way of the Prophet's uh, peace and blessings be upon him. There were people who would read poetry in the mosque, there were people who would gather in the mosque, there were people even who would live in the mosque who didn't have any other place to live. So it was a, an active place for people to gather and, and, to, and to discuss issues with each other and to grow as a community. So definitely we have to find ways to make the mosque as engaged um, with the community and for the community to be as engaged with the mosque as possible. I'm sure that in and of itself is an idea that you know you have to power through for, uh, for um, some community members just uh, you know historically given how the mosque has been. So has it been challenging um, serving as a young imam with uh, you know new ideas and sort of dealing with all of these issues? What is that? How is your response been from the community? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you have, to, you have to be of service to your own community. So in my community, um, uh, there's a lot of recent immigrants who, who come to, to the mosque and they conceive the mosque as uh, the way it would be in their, in their countries. And they expect it to be in the way it was back home in countries like Egypt or Syria or Pakistan. They expect it to be just like that. So um, their conception of, of the mosque is different than my conception of the mosque, but you have to work with your community and slowly exchange ideas and, and convince people as you take them to where you think is the best place to go. Uh, you can't be a dictator and just force your way. At the same time, you have to have these conversations to get the mosque to be uh, as effective as you want it to be. Uh, what do you make of some of the complaints that we receive? And I'll be honest, I'm one of them. You know, mosques are not necessarily responsive uh, to our needs. It's, they're not necessarily uh, women and child friendly. You know, I can give you a whole host. I'm sure you've heard of them. But what's yeah. your response to some of those issues? Uh, I think those are a lot of legitimate issues that come up. And um, sometimes I think the mosques want to respond and are not capable of responding. They're lacking resources. They're lacking... Uh, financial ability to, to respond to some of those concerns and those issues. Um, but also I think sometimes 
it's easy to complain without really being uh, engaged ourselves. So it's a two-way street. We want the mosque to be engaged with the community, but we need the community to be engaged with the mosque as well. I think if people were showing up and volunteering and putting all their effort in the mosque, it's hard for the mosque to ignore that volunteerism that, that they're getting because they're benefiting from it. So when, they, when that road exists and there's you know, a two-way street that, uh, that's there, I think that's how the community grows. Otherwise, if you know, there's two camps just arguing against Colliding, each other yeah. yeah, and just uh, um, accusing each other of not doing a good job, then we're not really going to get anywhere. So I always encourage people, yes, I understand you might not love everything about your mosque and the way that it deals with issues, get involved. That's the best way for your voice to be heard. How can we as a collective um, support mosques and our imams in a, in a better way? I think, you know, um, it's important for people to understand, to really try to understand and empathize with the job of, of imams because, uh, you know, I like to say we have, if you have 500 people who attend your mosque, you have 500 bosses. And each, <laughs> That's each, true. Each of them is evaluating, them, uh, evaluating you based on what they think your job is, not what your job actually is. So if somebody, uh, you know, maybe there's an older brother who prays all of his, mosque, his prayers in the mosque, uh, he, his job evaluation is that you're there for every prayer. If you miss a prayer, then you failed, right? <laughs> uh, if you're not in the mosque, if you're going to some event or something and you miss uh, the prayer, the sunset prayer in the mosque, then you know you failed his, his criteria. And then there's other people who want you to be doing a lot of youth work, and there's other people who want you to be doing this and that. So everyone's got different expectations, and it can be overwhelming for imams. And so I think people have to understand uh, the difficulties it is to be an imam, the, the demand on, on their time. If it's possible to hire more than one imam for a mosque, to have people who can specialize in different areas, an imam just for the youth, an imam maybe just for the, for the women, or, or someone working for, for the women, um, you know, to, to uh, fulfill the needs of the community, that's really important as well. So uh, I think the way to move forward is for people to em empathize with, with uh, what they're <laughs> dealing with and to help them prioritize what's the most important thing that you really need from, from the imam, that the whole community needs from the imam. Uh, create those priority lists so that they actually have goals that they can achieve rather than trying to achieve a million things and, and maybe not being able to do any of them. So how can um, Muslim organizations work with other organizations? I think that's a really important question. Um, I'm a board member on the Muslim Council Appeal, so what we've tried to do with that is to get all the Muslim organizations, or as many as we could, in the Peel region to uh, support one organization. So this to be is part not just it, is it just this is not just mosques, right? It's all organizations working with the Muslim community. So it's uh, Islamic schools and mosques, um, so all of them just uniting under one council. Oh, okay. And so having this council advocate for them. Um, politically advocate for them on social issues, advocate for them, and to also give them an opportunity to kind of coordinate with each other, to see what the other mosques are doing together, to kind of build some trust between different organizations. I think sometimes Muslim organizations, um, everyone is competing with each other, which can be good because then everyone gets better at what they're doing, but then we're also doing replicating the same work. And working in silos. And working in silos rather than working together. Whereas it's important to see, okay, if there's another masjid that's, you know, specializing in one issue and they're really good at it, maybe let's find a different issue that the community needs that we can specialize in instead. So those are important conversations that organizations should be having, especially when they're in the same city, in the same vicinity as each other, that instead of having the same mosques doing the same thing over and over, let's find ways that the mosques can work together you know, one mosque will specialize in one area, the other mosque will specialize in the other area, and that way we're not replicating the same work, and that way, that way the community is actually having a lot of their needs being met. I think you gave a very strategic response to a very complicated issue, so thank you very much, Imam Hindi. Thank you. Hey YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.